Hey, aren't you that guy from, that wrote No Easy Day? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I am. I'm looking for you all over the place. You mind if uh, we talk for a bit? No, that's cool. I'm not going to be able to do this all day, so why don't we jump down on the beach? <laughs> Well, hello out there, uh, Spartans. Uh, my, see, I can't even do that. Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Going yeah. it so far. Yeah. All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Colonel Tim Nye. For those who don't know me, we're here tonight in Pittsfield at, on the Spartan Up podcast. I've got standing to my right. My right is Joe Desena. Standing to my left is Sephra, the rewilding expert, and Woo. to my far left <laughs> is Johnny Waite, uh, the um, doctor to fix all the the ills all your ills <laughs> anyway <laughs> fix something right, fix something, you can fix yeah. something out there we all, all right uh, on this podcast uh joe went out and he interviewed um mark owen mark owen the author of no easy day uh, that's the book about the raid uh to take out osama bin laden uh, mark owen is actually his pseudonym a pseudonym he uses another or he has another name obviously uh we're not using that name so um Anyway, my student well, what was interesting, pudding. what was interesting about this uh, podcast, which was unlike any of the others, was uh, I was put in a black car. I uh, was blindfolded and driven to an undisclosed location and then uh, released on the beach. I don't even know where I was. And I'm out there just pacing back and forth. I decided to do some pull ups. And lo and behold, next to me doing pull ups is our guy. And um, it ensues uh, into a great um, I don't know, hour long interview. Uh, and all of a sudden a helicopter during the interview starts circling <laughs> over us. I love helicopters. It is, it is. <laughs> and I'm thinking them. they got me. <laughs> I don't know who it is that's got me, but they're gonna come but down. They're coming. They're coming to take me away. I got Colonel Nye with me. I don't know what's going on, um, but we got the interview done. It's an awesome interview. Who knows with what's going on in the, in the news um, uh, exactly what happened there no one will ever know but he'll he'll know and, and and the other guys that were to his left and right will know but um seemed like a seemed like a really great guy um got some great work done out there for all yeah. of us yeah listen listen anytime you read any book on history or any event uh if if four of us saw something happen over there in the corner we'd have four different events of what took place and I, and I think that's what's going on here. You've got different accounts of the same event because they were taken from different angles. It's slightly different moments, different snapshots, as long as the overall narrative fits together. Well, you know, we're, we're fine. There's a group of guys that are alive. There's a guy that's dead. Yeah, that's really <laughs> we're, the, we're hanging out with that's the really the end we're, result, isn't we're, it? We're hanging out with the guys that are alive. Right. So yeah, yeah. Right. Um, great, great podcast. Um, I'm sure it's got really uh, relevant information to um, rewilding the forest <laughs> that we, yeah. you know, we can oh, yeah, that we can talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, let's get to it. Let's yeah. see. Let's see what okay. it's all about. What are the odds? I'm in California. I'm doing pull-ups on the beach, and I run into Mark Owen, author of No Easy Day, famous book, famous guy, high-functioning one percenter, willing to talk to me. We're on the beach. This uh, signifies grit. I mean, what's you know better than me? What's grittier than than uh, Ocean, sand, messiness. Isn't there something that the seals would do, um, like a sugar cookie or something? What do you guys call it? Yeah, yeah, you get, uh, it's called surf torture. You get in trouble, they send you out, you roll around in the water, roll around in the sand, get the sugar cookie treatment, and then, you know, carry on with whatever they'll say. They and, so then you're, and then you're working the rest of the day with sand and your crotch and just a mess. It's just a, it's a mechanism to make you uncomfortable. That's yeah. all it is. And you're a big uh, believer. I, I, that's not a helicopter coming to take yeah. me out or anything. Right now, but Let's hope not. You're, you're, you're a big believer in, um, in grit and just getting uncomfortable and being comfortable in being uncomfortable. What, what techniques uh, have you used for your life? You grew up in Alaska. Like, what, what did you do to... Well, I, I don't know. You know, the, the SEAL motto is the only easy days yesterday. So that would infer that, hey, you're, you're uh, always uncomfortable. Um, they, they make us do plenty of drills and different training throughout my career, specifically more in buds, that um, you know, teaches you to be comfortable being uncomfortable. If you take uh, uh, you know, drown proofing, they hire, tie your hands and feet, throw you in the pool, 
make you do a whole bunch of drills. But to a lot of people, that would be uncomfortable, right? Your, your hands and feet are tied, you're in a pool, but, but it's a heated pool and it's in San Diego and there's you know six instructors swimming around and they're not gonna let you drown. So, so if, if so you're uncomfortable in that environment, how are you gonna be comfortable uh, in the mountains of Afghanistan in, a, you know, in the middle of winter in a firefight? You're not gonna be. Our big thing at Spartan is um, you gotta change your frame of reference. And I think that's what you're saying. Like you grew up in Alaska, it was awful as far as the temperatures were cold, there were, weren't a lot of people there, it was brutal conditions. And it made that heated pool easier? Or, or your training easier? Or your, the rest of your life easier? Or? Uh, to some degree, maybe, because I grew up, my high school didn't cancel school unless it was 55 below zero or colder. I, I drove a snowmobile to school every morning, so there was no heated school bus, not, none of that. Um, so growing up in that environment, uh, was arguably maybe a little harder than the folks here. Um, it was just different, different perspective. So when I went to Buds, being cold and, and the uncomfortableness that I felt in Buds or that I felt throughout my career, uh, I put it in perspective when I think back to how I grew up and, and that kind of helps me get through it. How did you, uh, did you always know you wanted to be a SEAL or how'd that come I, I read a book in junior high. I read a book in, in junior high about the SEALs in Vietnam and was hooked. I, uh, I wanted to serve my country. First and foremost, I wanted to you know wear the uniform. Although arguably, probably the Marines have a cooler looking uniform than the, than the Navy, but that's okay. Um, and then I wanted to see if I could live up to the challenges of, of uh, what I read in the book. All these guys, uh, you know, made it through Buds, went to Vietnam, and how long is me. how long is Buds for for, uh, for our viewers? Six months long, roughly. Six months, and is it just brutal or or? Yeah, it's 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 big. It's overwhelming. Um, you know, we could share some of those statistics here in a little bit, but uh, I broke everything down into one bite at a time. Because if you if you focused on, hey, look, how am I going to get through six months? That would be much too overwhelming for me. So right. I broke everything down into one meal, one bite. So hey, if I could make it to breakfast, awesome. If I could make it to lunch, even better. Dinner, okay, cool. Let's see if I can do it again the next day. And I broke everything down into small little pieces, and I did that throughout my entire career, no matter what I was involved in, what I was doing, everything was down, prioritized list, top to bottom, one bite at a time, the most pro uh, important things first, and then the, the things that uh, didn't need to be dealt with, I just simply moved to the side and I wouldn't worry about it. And, and um, one bite at a time is, uh, let me get through today, kind of thing? Like, Some, sometimes, hey, can I get days. through an hour? Right. It, it depends on what kind of pressure you're under, it depends on what you have going on. But uh, you know, obviously, the, the more pressure, the smaller bites, because you, you've got so much going on. And do you say to yourself, "All right, let me get through an hour. I'll, I'll reassess my situation an hour from it's Absolutely. terrible." Absolutely, right? Yeah, because things change too often. Priorities might change depending upon what's going on. So you're not saying you're, it's not out of the realm of possibility. You're in an awful situation right now. You've just been thrown in the water. You're covered in sand. You're exhausted. You haven't eaten. It's not out of the realm of possibilities, or is it? Where you say, "Let me just get through this hour. If I'm going to quit." It'll be an hour from now, I'll deal with it then. Or do you say, I'm never quitting? I, I honestly, uh, and you talk to different guys, some guys say, you know, hey, they thought about quitting every day at Buds. I honestly never thought about quitting. Every single day did I think, wow, this sucks? Absolutely. Um, yeah, it sucked every minute. But the way I looked at it was, hey, look, I looked at these instructors. If they can do it, I can do it. There's nothing that they've done that I, I can't accomplish as, as well. Yeah, my dad used to say, um, everybody goes to the bathroom, right? Doesn't matter what kind of clothing yeah. they're wearing. I don't care if there's anything Bud's taught me, um, and I think everybody comes away with a certain perspective on it, but, uh, but if Bud's teaches, taught me anything, was that you can accomplish anything you put your mind to. Hang on, sorry about that. Let's dive deeper into Alaska. So um, here's a guy who's uh, one of the best in the world you as, as far as um, making it through buds and then getting to the elite elite with, within the military um, I think it has something to do with your, your upbringing let's dive into Alaska give us some more stories about how how you grew up uh, man I graduated high school with three people in my senior class uh, I was the valedictorian in case you were wondering <laughs> nice uh, wasn't, wasn't don't, much add, don't ask me what my GPA was but <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, remote Eskimo village drove a snowmobile to school every morning bought my first assault rifle, AR-15, from my history teacher between classes, put the gun in my locker till the end of the day and, and brought it home. Wow. That, that was not uncommon. We got uh, several weeks off every year for moose hunting season. 
I mean, did you guys, did, is that how you fed the family? Did you uh -huh. guys hunt? Yep, it was all uh, meat that we hunted or, or salmon fish that we caught out of the river. That's great. And we had a garden, you know, maybe raised some pigs. And only 400 people in the town where you grew up? Uh, five to 700. Yeah. That's and not a lot. And so um, is it one of those stories, like how far was school? Uh, everything in the village was very close. As soon as you left the, the village itself, there, there really wasn't much. Maybe a few, uh, uh, we call them fishing camps, where people go to, you know, outside the village to, to work their fishing camp for a couple weeks. All right, so you're a young kid. You're growing up in 50 below weather in a small town, five, 600 people. And um, what do you do? You go out and hunt alone? You go with your dad? How does that work? I, I'd go out with my dad. But what's interesting is I remember a drill that our teachers had us do. And it had to have been third grade. Uh, I don't remember exactly, but it had to have been around third grade. It was wintertime. The majority of the people who, uh, who, who died uh, in the area would die of hypothermia, you know, fall through the ice, whatever it was. So the school, they had two different drills. One of them, they, they went out, cut a hole in the ice. And literally, yeah, I don't even know if we signed release waivers, but they'd take you out there, they'd dunk you in the cold water, I mean, it was the middle of winter, hole in the ice. They had, it was like 15 or 20 seconds that they held you in there, pulled you out, and then you were expected to rewarm yourself wow. in third grade. So, so how, would you, how would you do that? You know, I think they had a tent set up there, right. and, the, and the, the concept was, hey, get used to taking off all your wet clothes if you right. have to be naked or dr put dry clothes on. Whatever it is, is the, the steps to rewarm yourself in, in something, in a situation like that, because that happened a lot. The other thing they had you do is they, they gave everybody a, a one-gallon tin can full of soapy water, two matches, and you had to go start a fire from scratch, no, no paper. No, uh, no fuel, no starter fluid, no anything. Peel bark, start a fire, you had two matches. Third wow. grade, wow. and the first kid to build a fire big enough to take his pot of water, put it on top, get it to bubble over, he was the winner. Wow. But that was, that was third grade, how I grew up. Yeah, so that, that's the change of frame of reference we're talking about at Spartan, right? I mean, that's you, what I grew up. Every day, that was that every was day every for day. you? That was, there was nothing different, that was reality for me. So, so do you think, I think you touched on this, do you think that made everything you've done in the military that much easier relative to your peers? Uh, hey, some of the best SEALs I know uh, grew up in Brooklyn, middle of the city. Another buddy of mine grew up in Iowa and had never seen the ocean until he got to Bud's. So what is it that's different? I, I don't know. I don't think there's one common trait uh, that uh, all SEALs have. Uh, I think uh, when I look back at my history and how I grew up, I think that absolutely played into, I was good with a gun, I was good in the woods, and, and, good with and two that matches. came natural. Yeah, I was good with two matches, and uh, I was used to being cold. So, okay, I'm used to all those uncomfortable situations, so now when you get to buds and they put you in those uncomfortable situations, I was maybe a little better handling them, because I'd been in those situations before. Most people hate being uncomfortable. The second they're uncomfortable, they're in a situation or whatever it is that, that makes them feel that way, they want out of it. How do you, how do I you, loved the, the stuff we did in the teams where it made you feel uncomfortable because it was miserable, it sucked, it separated the men from the boys. Do you still and, do that? I, st I do it to myself. I try to make myself uncomfortable every day. Um, yeah. Yeah, you, you have do. to. I mean, the, the only easy day is yesterday. If you're going to sit back and think, hey, I made it, I got it, I'm good, you're wrong. You're never there. You never rest on your laurels. No, you can't. Ever. I hope you're not sitting still while you listen. If you are, you better get a burpee break in. So, um, at the end of the day, you're human. Just like all of us. We all have motivational issues. We all don't want to do it some days. We're just not in the mood. I, I think people watching this want to know how, how do you do it how do you get up out of bed and make it happen i tell everybody that the seals have no secret sauce we're not that special there, there's none of that i break everything down into the smallest little piece that i can that i can understand comprehend and, and attack and and then i do those one step at a time i don't think okay wow i don't want to get out of bed i think okay you know i don't want to get to the gym hey i just got to get out of bed i'll get out of bed and, and i break it down in little steps and you, and you do your thing um i look at everything that way I've been in so many miserable, uh, shitty situations that just plain suck. Okay, you're gonna do it, I'm not not gonna do it. Uh, but if you can sit back, look at yourself, laugh about it. Uh, I've been in some crazy gunfight situations, you name it, where everybody's miserable, but you look to your left and right, you see your buddies, they're kind of laughing and joking, and you're like, okay, all right. We're gonna get through this. Yeah.
Yeah, no, I like humor, that. Humor helps me a lot. If you, I guess, just take that step out of bed and then the second step and then make it into the bathroom and then work your way to the gym. And, that's it. Yeah. Uh, again, it's all back down to the bite-sized pieces. I always go back to that because that's, that's how I deal with it. Otherwise, you know, you can be completely overwhelmed. We talked a lot about budge training. I know there's a bunch of people that are saying, what exactly is it? It's six months long. You roll around in the sand. Give me, give me some... Uh, some stats like like how much swimming, how much running. What, what, what? It's 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 a it's a big lengthy process. Uh, a lot of a lot of people, the majority of the people that don't make it through the program simply quit. So they choose not to be there. Not that they couldn't do it physically, but they choose not to be there. So you know, hey, do they regret it? Oh, I'm sure every single one of them does. But I don't know. I've never been in their shoes. But um, but yeah, the majority of the people simply quit. If you break everything down, I've got some statistics here. This is a culmination of what each class, each BUDS class has done in a six month period of time. Each student runs 1,627 miles wow. during that time, swims 134.2 miles, runs the obstacle course 39 times, conducts 42 dives, spending 61 hours underwater. Uh, for those of you who shoot, uh, each class expends 1,413,000 rounds of small arms ammunition. Wow. Each class detonates 13,382 pounds of high explosives. You hike or patrol 150 miles. You complete a combat conditioning course, which is a 12 mile run, wearing 70 pounds of gear and three hours or less. And then if you add it all up, the, the equivalent, it's basically the equivalent of swimming from Cuba to the southern tip of Florida and then running all the way to New York City. It's unbelievable. So you break that down, you know, had, had they shown me these statistics before I uh, you went to Buds, no way, I'd, I'd be a banker or something. <laughs> I, just, I wouldn't have been a SEAL. It would have been completely overwhelming. You would have stayed at Eskimo. I, I, would, I would have moved <laughs> right back to Alaska and been, all right, this is not for me. But again, back to breaking everything down, again, the majority of the people quit. They thought about two months ahead of time thinking, wow, what if I can make it through rather than worrying about the, the, the bite, you know. The instructors, they bring you out, they say, okay, we're going to run four miles that way. Check. I'm not worrying about what the evolution is after the four mile run. I just simply Let me say, just get through okay, those four miles. I'm going to run my ass off for the next four miles. And then when we get back, you'll tell me the next thing to do. Uh, a lot of us used to laugh and joke. We look back on our buds experience and it was kind of nice because you didn't have to think of anything. You didn't have to do anything. It was simply do exactly what they tell you and do it at 200%. Right. And if you do that, it's great. It's like, it's like being a kid again. You, there's no responsibility other than do what you're told. Yeah, just do what you you're told. As you mature on the teams, you become a leader, you know, then you got more responsibility. But Yeah. And uh, you have a new book coming out, No Hero? Yep, yep. Is, um, that, is that out yet? November 10th. Yep. Um, I didn't think anything that I learned in the military would translate uh, to civilian life. I assumed that uh, I'd be a really good shot and we could go skydiving on the weekends and, and so on and so forth. But... I, you know, I didn't think I, anything would, would cross over. Well, it, it kind of has. I've got, um, so that's a little bit more what No Hero's about. It talks about a lot of my mistakes. Um, everybody's got, uh, everybody's made mistakes. I've certainly made a ton uh, in our line of work. If you don't learn from those mistakes, you're, you're probably not around to make that mistake a second or third time. So uh, this is really my way of sharing those lessons that I've learned. Through, through a long career. For, for anybody, so anybody in business yeah, or Yeah, no, this is not just, you know, hey, if you want to be a, some kid who wants to be a SEAL, that's not it at all. They're, they're very simple lessons. It's a, it's a fun, action-packed story with, with the, something that I screwed up or the piece that I learned, and it and it's, could apply to a, a soccer mom, it could apply to a businessman, it could apply to, to, uh, to some kid who wants to be a SEAL. Yeah. But it's... These Tri tricks were, of high-functioning folks, the things, that, not necessarily tricks, but things that help you yeah, perform at a little, high level. Little takeaways that I look back on and I think, wow, okay, I apply every single one of these things to my life today and, and I got out of the SEALs two years ago. Right. So, you know, everything I did learn in the teams does translate. I apply the exact same rules I did when I was in, uh, getting through buds, assaulting a target, going through any training I did, I apply those same ones now. Are you seeing, on that note, uh, and, and I'd love to go through those, but are you seeing other SEALs as successful as you are out of the military because they apply those those rules? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it, uh, if you make it through BUDS, you're automatically, you prove to yourself you're driven, and anybody who's driven can be successful. I, I don't, no excuses. I, I don't, I don't right. take excuses. You can do it. And, and again, back to BUDS teaches you anything. It's, you can accomplish anything you put your mind to, and I, I don't care where you're from, who you are, you know, if your parents were rich or if they were poor, I don't care. It doesn't matter. Just get through it. Yeah. 
you can be anybody can be successful. So um, give us a, give us some tips on the, you know what those five. Um, well, okay. So I've got, I've got a few things and and I've got them jotted down here. I can read through them, but they're just things that I look back on. Uh, the first thing I have is teamwork. There's absolutely zero that I accomplished during my career that I could not have done without a team. Without a team period. Nothing. And, and you know. And rowing uh, in the same direction and. Yeah, right. absolutely. And right. then you know, one of my next points is um, uh, a shared sense of purpose. So rowing in the same direction. Yeah, you right. got a you got a great team. You got to right. put the needs of the team above your own. Uh, Buds does that repeatedly. They throw you in a boat, make you paddle out through the surf zone. You're already tired, miserable, hungry. And then, you know, the, the boat gets flipped over in the surf and you got to work together as a team. It's very easy to see who's willing to put the needs of the team above their own. You, you can sit back, the instructors see it. The right. folks that, that pull back and worry about their own needs, they're typically not the ones standing there at the end. Sure. So you got to have that, that shared sense of purpose amongst the team. Um, I, I talk a lot about comfortable being uncomfortable. We, we talked about that a minute ago. You know, if you can't if you can't handle being comfortable with your hands and feet tied in the pool, how are you going to be comfortable in other areas? Right. Got. I love operating in that uncomfortable area. Um, prioritize and eat one bite at a time. Uh, I apply that to the the stress that I'm under these days. Uh, I break it all down. I prioritize it. If I can't affect it, I don't even worry about it. And and that's something learned. You know, you don't get good at that from the beginning. Sure, but uh, through I all I can't the do anything about the. We're in Alaska. I can't do anything about the weather. Deal with it. But I can go get this animal that's in front of me. Zero. Right. Things happen when you're assaulting targets. Where okay, it it happened. You, it's in the past. You can't do anything about it. But but worry about move how forward. you're going to apply, move forward. So um, yeah, uh, shared sense of purpose. All right, we touched on that. Prioritize. Be all in all the time. It's uh, a, a quote from uh, Tommy Valentine. Uh, was one of the better leaders, best leaders at the, at the command for a long time. And he used to ask uh, a lot of the new guys, at, at what level are you willing to participate? And the only right answer was be all in all the time. So think about that in poker terms, right? right. You're, not, you're not keeping any chips on your side of the table. You're, right. you're all in. Right. So whether you're sweeping the floors, charging a machine gun nest, whatever it is you do, do it be at 100, all 110%. in all the time. And yeah. that goes back to um, I don't worry about two weeks in advance, I worry about what I'm doing right then in the moment that I'm going to do that as best as I can. Um, Love that. We have basics, you know, shoot, move, and communicate. Those, those are basics, right? Um, I've been in plenty of situations where you have a good plan, and then, you know, you, what's Mike Tyson's quote? You know, everybody has a plan to get punched in the face. Right, well, right. Yeah, everybody's got a plan. I've been in plenty of situations where we got punched in the in the face, the plan goes sideways, and you got to have your basics, right? No, uh, Nobody's going to remember contingency 12 on PowerPoint slide 32 right. when you're getting shot at. You're going to remember, you know, the right. first. The, sure, what can yeah. I do right now? Yeah. yeah. So our basics are shoot, move, and communicate, right? You shoot accurately, safely, okay, that's day one, week one training. Can you move tactically? Okay, check. Can you communicate? Check. Right. If you can do all those three things, it's just a, a, a pickup basketball game at that point. You can throw us on any court got a whole bunch of trained athletes that are professionals and, and can do what they need to do. Um, change, evolve, adapt. Everybody th likes to think we change. We, in the SEAL community, we're constantly trying to change. That's still really hard to accomplish, but uh, thankfully it's part of our culture as an organization to, to really push that. It's got to be the hardest thing for most people is to change, right? No one likes change. Yeah, if you're comfortable, right? right? If you're comfortable, why change? It's working. Right. Something's going great. Okay, well, uh, we'll look at Blockbuster, right? They didn't change. They That's were comfortable. Right. They were doing great. Now, you know, nobody's ever heard of Blockbuster. Yeah, I remember a professor in college telling me uh, the locomotive companies would have still been around had they viewed themselves as transportation companies. They would have got into airplanes. They would have got into buses. They didn't want to change. They, they do didn't. trains, and that's it, and out of business. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but I put everything in perspective. That's another big one. Is I've been in so many really, really, really shitty situations, and... Um, and somehow I lived through it and walked away from it. And so now I look back and think, okay, listen, I, I'm, I'm nobody special. I haven't done anything different or better than anybody else, but I look back and think, okay, I lived through that shitty situation. I can deal with this. Yeah, yeah, that's, a, that's the frame of reference we always talk about. Well, thanks for uh, meeting me uh, doing pull-ups somehow yeah. <laughs> and doing this. It's funny how that happened. You're awesome. Yeah, appreciate thanks it. So much. Nice to meet you. Yep. Yeah. Um, 
really handsome guy. You know, it's a pretty remarkable podcast. Great to hear. Just kind of uh, reaffirms my my desire to always want to live in Alaska. You know what I mean? Well, There's I, not. I don't understand how he's handsome. You only saw the back a, of his head. Yeah, it's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> nice hair. Hair. nice <laughs> hair, though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah nice hair. Um, I don't. But, uh, I don't get rewilding jokes, but now I, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Takes a little while. <laughs> Takes a little. Okay. Not nothing in nature happens quickly. Yeah. You know? Um, but uh, no, I mean. I've always wanted to live in Alaska, and now now I have one more reason. You know, they teach those kids how to how to deal with hypothermia. They teach them, you know, how Third to reward grade. themselves. Third grade, right? I mean, that's true grit, resilience. You know, you you teach kids you basic survival in, for your environment. I mean, that's important. That that's a great way to raise your kids. I, I thought it was interesting though, because they asked him a couple times, or they they you asked him <laughs> if uh, if he felt that being from Alaska gave him an advantage. And I thought it was cool that he said no. He said, you know, obviously coming from there, those are all skills I drew on, but that, you know, the guys beside me were from Brooklyn and from Boston and from Kansas, and uh, that, you know, people are gonna develop strengths and skills in any environment. Um, of course, the ones that he developed there were important, but I, I really thought it was cool that he didn't, uh, you know, didn't put it all on that. Yeah, I would have definitely given an edge to, um, to Alaska, but um, then again, a guy from Alaska like him doesn't know what it's like to grow up in Brooklyn or Queens, and um, I've been uh, in Alaska in the wild during uh, extreme temperatures, and I've also been in Brooklyn, and um, <laughs> I, I would say Alaska played a role. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, cool. I, because again, a big part of the BUDS training is, is the isolation and yeah. the cold and the, the loneliness. Uh, which obviously more of that in Alaska than there would be in New York City. I so. think I remember him also saying that he bought a gun from his teacher. Yes. And that's how he became a shooter at such a young age. And I don't think teachers sell guns, at least openly, in Brooklyn. They don't. Students. No. You no. can get pizza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it was interesting. He, he bought it, uh, he said, in high school. Yeah. He bought it during, like, the first period. Bought it from his uh, teacher yeah. and stuck it in his locker. Yeah. And that's where it was all day. Now, there were only three kids in his class in his graduating class of his high school so incredible you know um different you've got to you've got to adapt to your environment yeah so so obviously he found himself in a pretty extreme environment later on you know that whole story with uh with the the mission um how much of uh that um how much of the lessons that he brought from that do you think other people could learn from um well anything that can go wrong will go wrong right i mean they had a they had some issues occur. Uh, the chopper went down, and um, but they were prepared. They were. And and if you're prepared and you have a plan and you're flexible, we've learned that in other podcasts, um, you can adapt and and get through it. And they did. Um, they also didn't know what they were going into. Yeah. Right. They had a pretty good idea what they were going into. I mean, things can change. Intelligence can be wrong, but based on what they were told and what they had seen they had a pretty good idea and and when you say that do, do you think um that meant that it was going to be a pretty quick in and out shouldn't get, face much resistance kind of uh, I, I think that's the best case scenario and again uh, intelligence could be wrong you know that night something could have happened but i think they i think they knew ahead of time that the, the level of resistance they would face was going to be minimal and then yeah. they, they built in as you said they're flexible but they build in redundancy to their plan so, you know, two helicopters took them in, but they knew they had other helicopters come to, come to grab them later kind of thing. So uh, they kind of think through all of those possibilities while they're putting the plan together. Yeah, so given that, I, I would think to answer your question, Johnny, um, there had to be some, I, I, I don't care how well trained the guys are, Colonel and I could, could answer this, but um, there had to be some fear going. I'm You're sure. going after the world's most wanted man, right? Uh, you got good intelligence, but uh, you've built redundancies. Well, he already I, said yeah, that. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. Be, I wouldn't <laughs> use the word fear. I mean, I don't know what they'd be afraid of, uh, other than failure. But I think more anxious um, th than fear. I mean, these guys. But they were running into every, the burning building. Yeah. Right. right? But it, but right. But everybody on that mission had been on multiple, multiple, multiple missions. They would faced it before. And the raid itself, other than the target, was identical to hundreds of raids they had done before. So it was really just the target that was different, not the. Uh, so it was, not it, the was, it, was, it was work as you. It was it was, it was like Zephyr going, and there was a day in the office. It was a day in the office yeah. for them. Yeah. But but the, the reason it was a day in the office, like you say, is because they've done it again and again and again. And right. We look at the other people we interview, uh, whether or that you interview, whether it's athletes or business people, and they talk about how important it is to put yourself in those uncomfortable situations until you become comfortable with it. 
So, you know, that, that really is, even though it's an extreme example, it's the exact same thing. Well, and, and to carry that further, in the, in multiple people have put this uh, out publicly, the night that that raid took place, that, that that unit, the Special Operations Command, conducted somewhere between 11 to 13 other raids yeah. uh, in Afghanistan, maybe Pakistan, uh, as well. So yeah. 11, 12 other groups of guys on helicopters went somewhere and conducted a raid. And some of those were far more, not more dangerous, but, but received far greater resistance. Yeah. And so there was fighting in these other locations. That, that So again, to them, it, 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 the target was bigger, the consequences were bigger, but the mission was identical. Hmm. Yeah, wow. I think, uh, I think offline I heard the day after he was sitting down having um, spicy wings. <laughs> it was literally like yeah, day, the, the day at the office. The day at the office. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, again, this is probably a correlation that maybe no one else might make to uh, to the Mark Owen story, but it kind of reminds me of um, permaculture, which is a design framework. Why does everything right? remind do, you of the woods? woods. <laughs> because that's the framework and the lens yeah. that I see the world yeah. through, right? Yeah. And it's all a matter of just um, what 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 analogies kind of you resonate to, but. Um, but the, but the whole point, a big premise of permaculture is just a design framework, right, that kind of mimics natural ecosystems. And, and uh, you do a sector analysis, right? So your body's zone zero, and then you have zone one, zone two around, around you. And you have to understand that it basically the premise is the problem is the solution, and you have to utilize your resource, right? So you think that these guys are going into these in, insanely unimaginable situations and then whatever they face they just have to take that problem make a solution right and then um see what they have working for them and and make it work you know utilize that resource so um great job to them and you got to be thankful for the people that that are willing to put themselves in in those zones yeah <laughs> absolutely <laughs> <laughs> I know. No, I where stomped we, him, right? Where do we <laughs> go wow. from there? Wow. Good know. job. I'm yeah. thinking, I want to hang guys. out with that tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. well, one of the other things that he talked about in there, and again, I hate to keep saying it, my recurring theme is their recurring themes, is that he can only control the, the space in front of him. He talked about the three-foot yeah. radius. And, he, and, he, and he, he, he talked about you know coming down and climbing a mountain and uh, having some difficulty. And, and the instructor came down alongside him and said, you know, don't look up, don't look down. Why are you wasting time doing that? Look what's in front of you. You can only control this amount. Focus on what's in front of you and start. Mm -hmm. And so he said once he kind of learned that, that, that was kind of a secret. Yeah, just focus on what's in front of you. And really, it, it's interesting because that's what he can control, right? We talked about Richard Branson and having 200 companies. That's his three foot. Is those is yeah. two hundred companies, right? That's what he can control that's because his own, that's zone his reach, one, zone right? One. That's that's how great his reach is. So some people's reach is here, and some people's you know, yeah, much but, much larger reach. But you yeah. got to know when you're over what you can control, yeah, what, what you control, control and what you not. can't. So that's the takeaway to answer your question, that's Johnny. Right? right? What, how can we apply it? Is is sometimes when you're looking too far out and stuff you can't control, you might get caught up in negative thoughts whatever maybe that stump you and uh zone just five. a waste of time that's yeah. zone, that is that zone five <laughs> in the wild that's that, that's out in the orchards can't deal with those sure. apple trees yeah, that is zone five. <laughs> and, and, and it'll be cool as we go through more and more podcasts and we do find these things that come up again you know the idea about controlling what you can taking that next step and always being willing to put yourself out there and and, and being comfortable with being uncomfortable like just training so much for this that it was a day at the office for them so uh if people want to see other podcasts how are they going to find them joe SpartanUpPodcast.com, where you will find uh, all kinds of information about Tim's Colonel Nye's interactive corner, um, permaculture, maybe. Uh, Sephra's permacultural um, Z zone, eight. zone, eight <laughs> zone <laughs> and Johnny Waits' um, stethoscope uh, zone. <laughs> Tips and tricks for how to build Dips a great life. <laughs> uh, see you soon. Uh, see you soon. Uh, see you soon. <laughs>